sponsored by the James Madison Council and the National Endowment for the Arts. Hello and welcome to the 2021 Library of Congress National Book Festival. I'm Ron Charles. I write about books for the Washington Post. Before we begin, please remember that we'll save the last 10 minutes of this 30 minute live conversation for your questions, which you can start submitting right now. I'm here with two of America's most celebrated fiction writers, Alice McDermott, author of What About the Baby? and George Saunders, author of A Swim in a Pond in the Rain. Alice and George, welcome. Thank you, Ron. It's wonderful that you've both released these illuminating books this year about writing, This Mad Pursuit. And your books complement each other so, so wonderfully, and they're really gifts to those of us that will never have a chance to take a class with you. So thank you for these books. Sure. Alice, I'd, I'd like to start with you. You say something in your book that struck me. A fiction writer can learn nothing useful at all from reading the work of book critics. <laughs> with some exceptions. <laughs> you didn't read that part about the exceptions, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. my wife's there. having that put on a pillow. Uh, but, but seriously, uh, well, let's talk about the, the purpose of fiction, which is very close to what both of you are writing about here. Alice, you write, I expect a lot from fiction, mine and yours and everybody else's scenes that burn through our temporal concerns. I expect fiction to be truer than life. And George, you say that great stories ask big questions like, how are we supposed to be living down here? And what should we value? And you suggest that fiction can help us become more expansive, generous people. It's very inspiring to hear you say that. I'd like to ask each of you to expound on, on that point, if you would. Could, could you start, Alice? <laughs> on the big questions. <laughs> um, yes, and thank you, Ron. And a um, uh, lot of other people can, can learn a lot of things from book critics, um, maybe just not fiction <laughs> writers, um, but the rest of the world out there might. Um, yeah, uh, you know, I've been accused a little bit of maybe setting the bar too high in that initial essay of what I expect from fiction. Um, but I think those of us who um, know the value of fiction know that um, there is no setting the bar too high. Um, we go to fiction um, for, uh, there's something that, weirdly enough, I had a dream last night about John Updike and John Updike has been in my mind all day long. And I've been trying to remember something that he said about art giving the spirit space to breathe, um, sort of a vacant lot for, um, uh, for, for play. Um, and, and I think that's what, what George is talking about in his study of the Russians, and I guess what I'm attempting to say to aspiring writers, um, that this is for our spirit, um, these works of art. This is where we go to allow our spirits to breathe. That's nice. That's nice. George, how about you? You make strong demands on fiction, too. I think that's beautiful. And, you know, I, I think it's a little bit sacramental in the sense that if you're reading a story, uh, say by Chekhov, and he nudges you to be marginally more generous than usual or to kind of do a double take about uh, something you would normally not even notice, then the beautiful thing is you've noticed that you have that capacity or you've been reminded that you have that capacity. And then so much like, uh, you know, going to church or meditation, you, you go into the rest of your day thinking, oh, I have capacities that I don't always use, but they're real. And so maybe I could start to use them a little more often. That's one thing. Um, but I always kind of try to ground myself um, by saying, okay, if I pick up a Chekhov story or I pick, off, pick up a novel by Alice, I observe my mind at the beginning. Where is it when I start? And then I observe it when I'm done. And that it really is the essence. Whatever happens, it happens in that way. And I do notice, you know, at the most modest end of things, I always feel more alert at the end of that, more alert to the world and more alert to maybe my own sometimes facile judgment. So I think that's a good thing, maybe, I think. Yeah, definitely. You both emphasize that point. You both write that what you I hope you don't mind me calling it a moral point of view, but that is you believe, as George says, that every human being is worthy of attention. And Alice says, 
We've been given a book with a baby in it. We damn well want, to know, want that baby accounted for by the end. I mean, fiction is one of the ways we engage our attention and, and account for others, right? It, so when we start with that premise, that implies some pretty weighty responsibilities for a fiction writer. I'm curious how your young students respond to that. I don't want to call it a burden, but it is a responsibility. Well, I, I, we talked about this today. I, I noticed how they always are a little relieved when you reassure them that their job is to account for the beauty in life and also the evil and to be um, sort of celebratory. You know, I think there's, there's always that, um, when we're young writers, I think we're a little worried about being perceived as corny. And so a, a kind of young writer move is to hold back on all the positive valences and emphasize the dark, fearful, negative ones. But I, I notice that my students are always a little relieved when I say, really, what I want to feel is you there in your entirety, and you like being alive. You, not always, and sometimes it's complicated, but basically those positive valences uh, are not only allowed, but they're maybe the, the hardest thing to get. And I can always feel them being a little relieved, like, oh, good, you know. That's nice. Alice? Yeah, and I think we, we have the benefit, um, especially teaching graduate students, but even undergrads who, who choose to take a, a creative writing course in fiction, um, we have an audience, we have a classroom filled with people who have been moved by fiction. They wouldn't be there if they hadn't been. Um, so it's not that you're suddenly telling them something they didn't know, that, um, that we go to literature uh, for those big themes and we go to literature um, to, to find out what it is to be human and how to be um, more human. They already know that. That's why they, um, that's why they want to try their hand. Um, and I think of what, where the relief comes in um, when you tell them, yes, those, those lofty goals that you feel a little sheepish about, those are good things. Go ahead, go for them. That's nice. Both of you emphasize the importance of intentionality, of, of placing details on purpose in a story. If for some reason, George, you call this the cornfield principle. Uh, based on the advice you got from a movie producer. And both of you are equally attentive to the role of surprise and inspiration to what George calls the ritual banality avoidance. So I'm curious how you negotiate that tension between intentionality and spontaneity when you're writing. Alice, you want to take that one? <laughs> I love the cornfield, though. <laughs> um, well, I think it's a matter of... Um, you know, this, this thing that we like to refer to um, uh, in a mysterious way as um, the, the, the magical things that happen in the midst of composition. Um, I think you're in trouble um, when you're looking um, to, uh, with too much focus for those details that will carry multiple meanings or that will change everything. Um, but when you're just trying to create a world and write a decent sentence and get the rhythm of your voice right and keep the reader with you, those things find their way into the writing. And the writer needs only to recognize them. So there, there is a kind of, um, you know, we're, we're working with this wonderful language that in many ways in, in initial uh, drafts is just an incantation. We're just using words to try to make the story come to life. Um, and it's only after we have worked at the words that we begin to see um, that we've had, actually there are details there that do have multiple meaning, but we never would have found them if we weren't just doing the hard work of craft. Hmm, interesting. You can't plant them. <laughs> right. I would, I would totally agree with that and say for me it's you you might want to distinguish between two different kinds of intentionality there's the in my practice anyway the bad kind which is you know i'm going to make the moon a metaphor for kmart or whatever you know and then you plan it all out in advance and uh that i don't trust but there's also the intentionality that comes with as alice said you've done this thing you've been in this zone then you come out of it and you look at it and you bless it and i think that's where the intentionality comes in for me. I, if I look at a draft and I'm like, eh, yeah, I don't know. There's a little more light in there, but I can't get it out. Then I haven't blessed it yet. You know, they go through it again and again. There'll come a point where I feel like, yes, everything that's there, I intend in the sense that I bless it. I'm not sure I could account for everything or explain everything. 
some of it I might not even see, but by reading through it from the beginning to the end and feeling good about it, I bless it. And that's the kind of intentionality that includes uh, rational and super rational um, parts of the process, I think. What do you mean, bless it? Why do you use that, that sanctified word? It's kind of like if you, if you're, I think I mentioned in the book, if you're throwing a party and you're running around all day and you're arranging the doilies and everything and picking the music, and then just as you're about to uh, invite the guests in, i.e. send the story out to the magazine, you just take a look and you go, yes, you know, everything, I, I, I'm seeing it. In this case, it's, I read the story from the beginning, beginning to end. And I get a feeling like, yes, I bless it. And whatever is in there, even if I don't know about it, I, I'm for it. <laughs> Something like that. Very intuitive. <laughs> Alice, do you feel that way too when you finally send something off? Oh, I guess I feel a little bit more um, get rid of it. <laughs> uh, maybe it's the way you send your kids out. You bless them, but then you're glad to see them leave. <laughs> and and I, I think some of it is uh, that sense of at this moment, in this story, with these characters, with all the things I have proposed and, and struggled over sentence by sentence by sentence, I have reached the point where I can say, that's the best I can do. That's the story that wanted to be told. That's how I was able to tell it. Um, I told the story that was given to me. Um, I'm paraphrasing um, the wonderful Philip Levine, um, who said, you know, I write what I was given to write. I, I've written the story I was given to write, and um, I can't think about it now. <laughs> now it's out the door. <laughs> both of you write great sentences and great lines, and both your books celebrate great sentences and great lines in a very specific way. And is that because you're just naturally poetic, clever people, or is this a result of careful, hard revision of those sentences over and over again until you get the sentences where you want them to be? I, I, I think, think it's that. Yeah, I think Alice, it's that. Go ahead. I, oh, George, go I'm ahead. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm having a little delay. Um, I, for me, it's it's that what you said. It's just you you um you you might be inspired the first time, but you might not. So then you you rework it. And I I think of a a story as being you know seven thousand sentences, and my job is to kind of make sure that I've um sort of tweaked each one to be the most like I want it to be and, and thereby infuse the story with micro choices. So, uh, and for me, that really only happens on the sentence level by ear. The, the a sentence comes to me like, ah, that sounds a little banal or that sounds a little inaccurate or it sounds like I'm infusing it with lyricality as a trick. And then just that constant readjusting of the sentences is, is what makes the whole, the whole story for me. But it is a lot, a lot of tweaking and work and expressing your opinion over and over again um, every time you come to the sentence. Alice, do the lines just come to you like Kubla Khan, all fully formed? Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> Wouldn't I love that? <laughs> there's, a, there's a wonderful um, something that Eudora Welty said that I have um, hit over the head of many students, um, but I love it because it's sort of a great definition of being in the zone. And she said, you reach that moment where you know the sound of the next sentence before you know the words. Um, that that yeah. sense of um, you hear it, just as George said, you hear it. Now you have to find the words, but somehow it's the form is already there. Um, it's the thing I look for as a reader. I mean, I, I read fiction as much for the sentences that that make me want to jump up and down and and grab somebody by the collar and say, read this, as much for story or character or information or anything else. Then how do you avoid that sense of every sentence being worked over and reading is like sipping cream, where it's just, too, you know, every line is self-consciously poetic. How do you avoid that while you're trying to get every sentence perfect? I think that's part of the work is to sometimes take the fancy clothes off and get the sentence back to his underwear. You know, you, you, you're aware, I mean, your stylistic control um, extends even to that. So if you if you have a bit of a pompous sentence, you might say no 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 I can't I can't have that, and then you take it down to the basics. So there's nothing that isn't included in that. What what we're calling crafting beautiful sentences also includes, for example, purposely making a very crude 
basic sentence. Um, it's, you can, it's like a music producer, you know, you can purposely detune the guitars if you want. It's still intentional. Alex? Yeah, and I think there has to be a sense of inevitability. Um, it's not a sentence um, that just hangs in the air somewhere. It's a sentence in, that's part of an of a ongoing story, that's part of a character's life, that's part of all the other things that you're juggling as you're trying to tell a story. So I think there, it, you do have to lose that self-consciousness of how beautiful is this. Um, another thing <laughs> Laura Welty says is that, you know, there's no beauty. All beauty has something of the inadvertent about it. Um, oh. So it's not, it's not that I'm going after a beautiful sentence. I'm going after the right words to add to this story so that character comes to life and, and the world is still spinning. And, and so you do have that sense of inevitability. George points out um, in his book talking about Tolstoy, um, how Tolstoy just adds up facts. Um, that's what he's given you. He's not giving you beautiful sentences. He's given you facts um, and, and story is coming to life through them. Um, you don't pause to say, oh boy, that's a gorgeous sentence. You just take in the facts. There's a sense of this is how this story must be told. It's absolutely inevitable. It could never have been told another way. Wow. I can't remember, I might have read this in your book, Alice, but one of the most beautiful sentences is Jesus wept. You know, right. Right. because it comes at exactly the right moment and it's and it's the shortest it could be, you know, that. Right. Right. Although I, I my mother used to use that sentence in other contexts and it wasn't that beautiful. <laughs> yeah. She saw, she saw my room. Jesus would Jesus wept when he saw the state of your drawers. So <laughs> um, context is everything. <laughs> yes. I want to talk about research. You mentioned it earlier. Uh, Alice, in your collection, you, you write, I think humorously, I write about a culture I know fairly well in order to resist the siren song of research. <laughs> but I suspect you're being at least partially tongue in cheek there. Uh, you must do research to get all those 20th century details just right. And George, your novel about Lincoln waded into probably the most studied period of American history. So you must have done research. Tell me how you integrate that work into the creative process. George, go. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I, you know, kind of tiptoed up to the vast ocean of Lincoln research and got really scared. And I thought, okay, um, since it's a novel, supposedly, or something like a novel, um, let's not go looking for something until we need it. You know, like if I need, if I need a, an illustration of X for dramatic purposes, I'll go get it. Um, so that's mostly what I did. I avoided research, except when the dramatic structure told me I needed something. And then after a few years of doing that kind of research, I had a few things uh, that I stumbled on that I thought might be fun to use. But again, I kind of, you know, like a bouncer, I kind of kept it outside the rope uh, until it was needed. So that, that way you're not just, you know, you're really not claiming to be an expert in the period, but you're an expert at darting into the period to get out what your circus needs, you know? Otherwise, it would have been, you know, 80 years of research. Right. Alice, how about you? Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. There is that sense of um, plug in what you know, take a while, guess, um, but but don't stop, again, story and character and everything that, that's evolving. Um, but there are times when, um, you know, I face a character and, and say, I need to know what she knows and I don't know a thing. Um, I had a character in my last novel who was an expert laundress in the early part of the 20th century. Um, and I knew she knew an awful lot. And I knew I had to find out what she knew before I could take her any further uh, into the story. Um, so I had great fun uh, tracking down um, laundry guides for housewives from 1909. Um, I didn't test them all out, although some people told me they have tested them and they indeed were true. Um, but that's the kind of research I simply had to do to enter the head of the character um, because I knew how much she knew that I didn't. Wow, interesting. You're, you're both so generous and attentive to other writers, both current and past. And it's a, tens a testament to your belief that good writers need to be avid readers. The theme of the National Book Festival this year, as you know, is open a book, open the world. How have books opened the world for you, George? 
Well, you know, in kind of a funny way, I was, um, I grew up in Chicago and I kind of stopped reading and I was going to be a musician. That was the, the plan. And then I read what I now know to be a terrible book, which is Atlas Shrugged, or at least, a, you know, a kind of weird hearted book. Um, so, but um, it was a thousand pages and I read it and it did that thing that even clumsy fiction can do, which is make people start moving around imaginary buildings and so on. Uh, and that's why I went to college, actually. I, I wasn't going to go. And then I read that book. And in this very strange, comical way, I just thought, oh, wow, that's amazing. Intellectual stuff. You know, I could go to college. And I had this kind of weird image of just walking across a campus with Atlas shrugged under my arms, you know. So, so in that really crude way, it just got me the life that I have now. And I think it, since then, um, better books have just been like a carrot on a stick uh, reminding me that the, the state of my awareness at the moment is both inadequate and expandable. So you read Tolstoy and, uh, or you read Toni Morrison or you read Grace Paley and, and you think, oh yeah, I'm, I'm kind of a little frozen as a dummy right now, you know, just out of habit. Um, but the capacity for understanding is infinite. Uh, so the books just sort of, for me, they kind of tap on the winch, you know, on the window of the car in which I'm asleep and says, hey, buddy, you know, life is going by. Try to try to look alive. You know? And it, it's, it's happening over and over. It happened with these uh, seven Russian stories every time I went through them. That's great. Alice, how about you? You know, I, um, looking back from this great age of mine, um, I, I, I often feel grateful that I started reading before anybody thought to ask a young reader to look for herself in the novels that she reads. Um, I'm so glad nobody told me that was supposed to be a goal of reading. Um, so I fell into reading delighted that I didn't find myself, um, that I could leave myself behind, um, that it wasn't about me. And yet I understood these people and I recognized um, something that I had not really experienced, but as if I had. Um, so for me, it was always that um, dwelling in uh, another sensibility that shouldn't have anything to do with my life and yet has more to do with my life than anything else I've ever experienced. What a beautiful lesson that is when that happens. You know, when you see that these, these apparent boundaries that we have aren't actually as, as, as solid as we think. That's beautifully put. That is great. We have a bunch of questions here, and I've taken too much time because uh, I could talk to you guys forever. Uh, Marion wants to know, is there a particular book or author that inspired you to become a writer? George? Well, you already mentioned yours, George. It was, it was Ann Rand. You can take that to your face. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, I mean, how about you? Honestly, it was In Our Time by Hemingway was kind of the perfect book for a young you know, I thought, oh, if you're an author, you get to go to do cool, adventurous things. So that was big for me, too, in our time. Excellent. Alice? I think to, um, there are two books. One, kind of the in our time equivalent, was Moss Hart's Act One, his um, autobiography, which made me want to be a playwright because it looked like so much fun um, to be on Broadway. Um, but the book that made me really want to be a writer um, and, and the writer I suppose I'm still trying to be um, was a Russian beauty, Nabokov's short stories um, that I took down from the shelf of the Elmont Public Library um, when I was uh, between semesters as an undergrad, sort of vaguely thinking I wanted to write and telling myself that I would go to the library and, and take down from the shelf um, a book by any writer whose name I had heard but I had never read. Um, and I took down those stories and I took them home and I read them on the front porch and, and, and I have a vivid recollection of saying, if you spent your whole life trying to write a story as beautiful as any one of these, and even if you failed, what a great life you'd have. Wow. Yeah, so beautiful. Yeah. Tracy wants to know how your priorities in writing, reading and teaching have changed through over the years if they've changed. Uh, well, mine has changed I, I was, because I've retired from teaching. <laughs> so <laughs> so okay. I've lost one of those yeah. obligations. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> mine have, I don't know if my priorities have changed, but I was saying to Allison Ron before that I've noticed, uh, I just started teaching this semester and how linked up those things are now for me. Like I have a, 
almost like a um, uh, a reliance on teaching to then push me into writing. And like, I'll get done with my, my teaching uh, days and feel so liberated to go back to being an artist, not have to explain anything or rationalize anything. And then when I come back to teaching, there's a little burst of being pleased that I could talk about it again. So it's been, I, I think it's been kind of symbiotic all these years. That's nice. Uh, Patricia has a tough question. Do you have regrets about choices you've made in past novels or stories that you're willing to talk about? <laughs> regret that they didn't sell more, Ron. <laughs> Deep regret of mine. Uh, never look back, never regret. <laughs> go forward, okay. go forward. <laughs> I, I, think it's, I think it's kind of important to say, well, whatever I did, I did it for a reason. You know, I, I was a, a sort of a misshapen artist back then. I did this, but then that helped me become, you know, who I am now. So I don't, I don't spend too much time with that, really. You know. Uh, let's see. Uh, someone wants to know. Uh, Marion wants to know what advice you would give a new author who's just finished a manuscript and who is looking for a publisher. And you must get this question a lot from your own students. Send it to Ron. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't do well, that. the process is you find you you find an agent. Um, you can often do that by getting uh, one a list of agents from someplace like poets and writers, um, and you find an agent who responds to your work, and um, and then you hope the agent finds an editor who responds to your work. But the most important thing is that you start writing the next novel while all this is going on. Um, don't stop. Keep writing. Interesting. Yeah, that sounds that sounds like good advice. Yeah. George, you have anything to add to that, or is that pretty much the standard advice? Well, just the idea that you know the agent actually is sort of the gatekeeper these days. That that actually is how it works. Um, maybe the hardest thing to get, and if you get a good one, as I was lucky enough to do, it changes the whole course of your career. But that seems to be where the bottleneck is, you know. And and um, uh, and then the question of how do you get an agent? That's that's another one. So it's it's. Uh, it's tricky, but I also tell my students that I think of, me, of maybe all of the major art forms that publishing is sort of the most egalitarian and the most, um, I would say it's uh, relatively virtue rewarding. So I, I try to encourage my students not to worry too much about the finding contacts fade and all that. I kind of encourage them to just trust that if they make a beautiful book, put all their energy into that, that the system is fairly just. Uh, and that has the effect of maybe just calming things down and letting them put their energy where it belongs, which is in that difficult, difficult thing of finding, you know, what you're supposed to sound like and learning how to revise and all that. Nice. Yeah, that is good calming advice. Uh, Susan wants to know, uh, she knows writers who say, when they're judging a book of uh, work of fiction, they'll say, well, it's not the transit of Venus. Uh, is there a book for each of you that you have that is sort of the platonic ideal of the great novel that you judge every other novel against? Transit of Venus is a pretty good choice. It is good. It is very good. <laughs> it's a wonderful novel. Yeah. <laughs> George, do you have a book like that? Well, I, for personally, it's Dead Souls. I, I, there's something about that book I haven't been able to figure out, and I, um, I don't find it that moving. I don't find it that funny. But somehow, whenever I think, you know, what book has, what book feels the most like the life that I've lived, Dead Souls somehow comes up. So that's one that I, 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 I think about. Although I also just finished um, Don Quixote for the first time. And that's, that's one, you know, you can say that of every book, you know, it's not, it's no, it's no Don Quixote, except that book. We don't, we don't want one book, you know, yeah. readers <laughs> don't want just one right. book. We don't want to say, this is it. I, I'm done. I got it. It's the best. Um, you know, you want all kinds, you want some not so good books. You want some good books, some great books, um, different kinds of great books. That's the pleasure yeah. of it. That's why we need literary oh. critics so that they can tell us um, <laughs> about the the, the 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 breadth of the literature out there for us. See, we need you. Well, I was thinking. <laughs> I was thinking about that combination of uh, the Grapes of Wrath, which I love, and then the book before that, which now I'm going to blank on the name. Steinbeck's. Um, is it called? It's very similar. It's a book about some uh, budding socialists, and uh, and it's just not as good. 
but you can see how the how the the less good kind of on the nose book led to the beautiful masterpiece. And you think, well, you you can't just pluck the grapes of wrath out of nowhere. You have to make some you know some mistakes. Right, right. It is, right. It mistakes. is you know. it's such a pleasure to talk to you. I'm sorry we're out of time. Thank you, Alice and George. It is always a treat to see you. I hope we see you in person one of these times. And to all of those uh, in the audience, thanks for watching and submitting your questions. I want to mention that both these authors have great websites. Just Google their names, and you can continue following the National Book Festival through Sunday night at loc.gov bookfest. Thanks so much. Good night. Good night.